So a jubilee is a big deal. Has anybody here celebrated a wedding jubilee? Let's give these people a round of applause. <laughs> That's fantastic. Anybody here celebrated two wedding jubilees? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Anybody here have their birthday jubilee this year? Oh, you may not want to reveal yourselves. <laughs> That's okay. Now, I have to tell you that we have here with us this weekend or this week the expert on the biblical jubilee. That's Dr. John Bergsma. He's going to give the next talk on the jubilee. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to get your toes wet. Get ready for the deep dive after this. So I'm just going to introduce the idea of the biblical jubilee. As Scott mentioned last night, God's teaching on the jubilee is given to us in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. And it's all part of how God taught his people how to sanctify time. You know, God alone is holy. He's all holy, infinitely holy, set apart. And yet he shares his holiness with created things so that we can understand and even partake in his holiness. So there are holy places. There's a holy land. There will be a holy city, a holy temple. And within the temple, the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant. So there are holy places. But God also makes holy times. He designates certain times so that we will learn, as Scott talked about last night, to sanctify the whole rhythm of our lives and learn to share in God's holiness. So God made every week a holy day, the Sabbath. In fact, the whole structure of time, is the, the week is structured on the basis of the Sabbath, the seventh day, the holy day. But then there are feast days throughout the year, as Scott talked about, and then there are even holy years. Now, to fully understand the Jubilee, we have to really get the concept of the holy years. Every seventh year, as God teaches in Leviticus, is to be a Sabbath year. And that means it's to be a year of rest. So every week, every seven days has one day of rest. Every seven years has one year of rest. And that was taken in a very literal way. Ancient Israel was an agrarian economy. Almost everybody made their living and survived by agricultural cultivation. And so to take an entire year without plowing, without sowing, without reaping, called for a tremendous act of trust in the Lord. The land has to lie fallow, and you have to trust that God is going to provide enough from what grew in, its, in the previous year, which you stored up, and what grows in itself in the current year. So this principle of trusting that God is going to provide, even without our labor, is really a continuation of the principle of the manna. Immediately after the exodus, God's great act of deliverance of his people from slavery in Egypt, he leads them into the desert, a place where you, you can't do any agriculture because there's, there's simply, there, there's not enough rainfall. Nothing grows or hardly anything grows. God says, I'm going to give you bread from heaven. I'm going to give you manna. And I'm going to give it to you every day. Enough for each day. And God said to his people, don't hoard it overnight. Because if you do... It's going to rot. So what did some of God's people do? They hoarded it overnight. And it rotted. And God said, don't do that. If you do that, you're going to be disciplined. But he said, I'm going to give you twice as much manna on the sixth day. When you go out to collect the manna, 
on the sixth day, you're going to collect twice as much, and I want you to keep it overnight that night, and it's not going to rot. Guess why? Because I want you to rest on the seventh day. I want you to trust in me. On the Sabbath, even God's bakery is closed. So guess what some, some of God's people did? They went out on the seventh day to try to collect manna, and they found none, and God said, Oy vey. <laughs> These people, they collect it when I tell them not to, and they don't collect it when I tell them to. So the point of the, the manna is to teach God's people to put their absolute trust in him, not in their own resources. So it's that same principle that is given in the Sabbath year. So it's, it's a continuation of that principle, that rule of radical trust in God. And so God teaches them in Leviticus 25 when he, he gives them this law, the Sabbath year, if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year if we may not sow or gather our crop? I will command my blessing in the sixth year so that it will bring forth fruit for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating old produce until the ninth year when its produce comes in. Because in this eighth year, after the Sabbath year, they're sowing again. And so in the ninth year, they start to eat once again what they themselves have planted. And so God says, until the ninth year, when his produce comes in, you shall eat the old. So God, just like he did on the sixth day, he gave more manna so they could rest on the seventh day. God says, I'm going to bless your crop in a particular way in the sixth year so that you have enough to sustain yourselves in the seventh year and you can rest and enjoy your relationship with me and, and trust in me. So the point of this Sabbath year is to ensure that God's people are not going to become slaves to work. They were slaves in Egypt. They knew what that was like. The Egyptians didn't have a Sabbath day or a Sabbath year. Every day, you got to make those bricks. You got to collect straw to make those bricks and build those pyramids. <laughs> no rest. And God is teaching people, I don't want you to live like Egyptians. I don't want you to have a utilitarian mentality, a consumeristic mentality like the people of this world. I want you to live as my people for whom I provide. And I want you to have me as your highest priority in life. So thinking about that principle of the, the Sabbath year and the Sabbath day, how do you think God feels when we treat our Sabbath, our Christian Sabbath, which is Sunday, it's transferred to the eighth day, the day of the resurrection, how do you think God feels when we treat it like any other day of the week? We go shopping, we catch up on work, we we. You know, certain things are, are fine to do on Sunday, especially if they're not your regular work. But when we treat Sunday like any other day, it wounds God's heart. I thank God for the Christian witness of Chick-fil-A. <laughs> they keep the Sabbath. Hobby Lobby also, I believe, keeps the Sabbath. And, and you can imagine there is enormous pressure for them not to do that. Thank God for their Christian witness. You know, there, there's a joke about uh, a Jew who was on the Sabbath day, he was, he was lounging on the beach and just enjoying the sun and the waves with his family, and he noticed his neighbor who kept his shop open, and he was selling his wares, and he was doing his inventory, and he was doing his accounts and working really hard, running around, and, and so the guy on the beach said, what are you doing? And, and the guy running the shop said, well, you know, I, I got to keep my shop going. Oh, why? Well, if I don't keep my shop going on the Sabbath, I'm, I'm going to be beat out by the competition. Well, why is that important? Well, because I, I really need to make a profit. I need to build up a, a financial nest egg. Oh, wh why do you want to do that? 
so that someday I can just retire and relax on the beach with my family. I'm doing that now. <laughs> so there is such a deep tendency in human hearts to become slaves to work, to make work the God of our life and to keep pursuing and pursuing and pursuing the things of this world. God says, slow down and take time to be with me, to be with your loved ones, and to rest. Now, it's interesting that today in the modern era, we also know that there's an agricultural reason for the Sabbath year that was kept in ancient Israel long before the modern understanding of the need for crop rotation. The soil was able to recoup its nutrients. With the soil itself, the land itself was allowed to rest every seven years. So the Lord was actually teaching his people principles that he had built into creation itself. Now, having understood that, we need to talk about the Jubilee. The Jubilee year is greater than the Sabbath year. The Jubilee is the year that takes place after every seven times seven years. So in other words, it's a kind of super Sabbath. The Jubilee is the Sabbath of Sabbaths, the 50th year. And it was called the Jubilee because this year, this special year that most people would only experience once, maybe twice in their lifetimes, was announced at the end of the 49th year by the blowing of the Yovel, the ram's horn. And it had a distinctive sound in contrast to the shofar, which was blown in other Sabbath years and on certain other occasions. And the, the sound of the horn would have been a very striking sound that would recall the Israelites meeting with the Lord God at Mount Sinai. Because what happened when, when they met God at Mount Sinai, at the top of the mountain, there was a very loud trumpet blast. So the blowing of the shofar every seven years and the blowing of the yovel in the jubilee year is a reminder of their encounter with their God at Mount Sinai. Now, what did that actually sound like? Would you like to know? This is a yovel. Now, you may, seen some, you may have seen pictures of some of them that have a um, curved shape, like corkscrew type shape, and those actually come from a gazelle in Africa. They're very common today, but, but this is an actual ram's horn. And this was the sound, blowing this was the sound that the yovel, the ram's horn, would make in ancient Israel. I'm going to blow it for you. You ready? <laughs> pretty striking sound, huh? All right, so now what happened in the Jubilee year when this that was announced by the blowing of the ram's horn? Well, the Jubilee, like the Sabbath year, it's a year of rest, but it's also a year of release, and it's a year of return. I'm going to explain each of those. First of all, a year of rest. Just as in the Sabbath year, people in the Jubilee year take off a year from their farm labor, and they let the land itself lie fallow. So that means that in both the 49th year and the 50th year, you are trusting God, and you are not sowing or reaping, but you are eating of what grows of itself and what you have stored up from previous years. So it's a permanent reminder that the most important thing in life is their covenant relationship with God. He is the provider. It's not by their own labor that they sustain their lives, but by God's provision. So it's a year of rest. Secondly, it's a year of return. Now what that means, as Scott mentioned last night, is that any land that has been sold off during the past 50 years gets returned to its original owner. <laughs> 
In other words, if you had gotten over your head in debt, maybe there were a couple of years of drought, maybe there were locusts, maybe dad drank away the family farm, things like that happened, you'd have to sell your land. In an agrarian economy, not to have land is to be reduced to permanent poverty. If you don't have land, all you can be is a, a day laborer and you, you can barely subsist. So to lose your land is a really big deal. But in the Jubilee year, you get it back. Everybody gets back their land. Now, as you can imagine, that affected the price of land because any time anybody sold their land, it's only sold for the number of years until the next Jubilee. It's really only a lease. And therefore, the price of the land is affected by how far it's going to be till the next Jubilee. If it's only five years to the next Jubilee, the land gets a low price because you're going to have to give it back soon. If it's 45 years till the next Jubilee, it's a higher price for the land. What's the point of all this? The land of God's people is not real estate. It's not a commodity to be bought and sold to be traded. It's a sacred inheritance from the Lord. When they came into the promised land, after their 40 years in the desert, the land was all distributed among all the tribes and the clans within the tribes and the families within the clans, and every family got their piece of land, their piece of the holy land promised by God that they were to pass down through the generations. It's a sacred inheritance from the Lord. Nobody can be permanently alienated from their land. It's God's promise to his people. But also, it's a reminder that the true owner of the land is not the people, but God himself. In fact, even Israel itself understood that they themselves are sojourners in the land. Ultimately, the land belongs to the Lord. He's the owner. It says in Leviticus 25, verse 23, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity. That means only until the next Jubilee. For the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. So God's people, even though they, they receive the land as an inheritance from the Lord, they are God's stewards of the land. They are God's representatives. That goes all the way back to the command he gave them in Genesis 1. Have dominion, subdue the earth, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. So, so they are tenants to care for the land that God has entrusted to them, not owners. It says in the letter to the Hebrews, by faith, Abraham sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Their stay on the land is temporary because there is an ultimate promised land that they still look forward to, and so do we. In fact, the word for sojourn, paroikeo, is actually the root of our word parochial and parish. That's why we're parishioners. We are sojourners. That means we're not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven, the true promised land. So, Part of the purpose of the Jubilee is to remind God's people that they are sojourners with him looking forward to that city that is to come. And then finally, the, the third dimension of the Jubilee, I, I spoke about rest and return, and the last dimension is release, release. And really, that's the heart of the Jubilee legislation is, is release. Well, what kind of release? Really, two, two kinds of release. It says in, in, in uh, Leviticus 25.10, You shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim release. The Hebrew word is deror, deror, D-E-R-O-R, -E release. Proclaim deror throughout all the land to its inhabitants. So first, release of slaves. Release. 
all slaves who were Israelites are to be set free in the Jubilee year. Now, in the ancient world, if you go bankrupt for the same reasons, you know, locusts or drought or, uh, you know, drank it away, you, you don't just file for chapter 11 restructuring <laughs> and start over. No, you probably will have to sell yourself into slavery and your wife and children as well. That's what it meant to go into debt in the ancient world. You, you know, you sell your land, but then if you're still in debt, you sell yourself and your family into slavery. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a wealthy male relative, he can redeem you by paying a redemption price to your slave owner. And that's great. Then you get released. You get redeemed by your kinsman redeemer. But if you don't have a kinsman who is well-to-do enough to redeem you, you're stuck. You're enslaved. But in the Jubilee year, you're set free. And your whole family is set free. So that meant that no member of God's people could be permanently enslaved. No member of God's people could be truly owned by another. Sooner or later, at the next Jubilee year, they're going to be set free. What's the point? They belong to God alone because he is their kinsman redeemer. When did he redeem them? At the Exodus. It's God who paid the price and set his whole people free from slavery in Egypt. So no Israelite can permanently remain a slave in the Jubilee year. They get set free. And then there's another kind of release that is added by the legislation in the book of Deuteronomy. It's kind of specifying further. It's not only that slaves are released, debts are released. That mortgage on your second camel, that Jerusalem credit card, wiped clean. No more debt. You're out of debt. No member of God's people can be permanently oppressed like so many people are today, under the weight of debt. You know, that's part of the why it's a good reason to contribute to such a wonderful university as Franciscan University so that students don't graduate here burdened under decades of student debt. That's part of the Jubilee principle. So whoever is in debt at the Jubilee year, that slate is wiped clean. Now, the Jubilee, besides its theological purpose, also had social implications. The Jubilee meant that no Israelite could be permanently impoverished. No elite group of people could accumulate more and more and more of the wealth while others became poor. No member of God's people could be permanently alienated from their land or enslaved. It all goes back to the Exodus. What happened at the Exodus? This is what Yahweh did for Israel. Israel was enslaved. God set them free. Israel was bankrupt in debt. God released them from that debt. Israel was homeless, landless. God gave them a land. So. The Jubilee is meant to be a 50-year internal exodus, a reminder, a permanent reminder to every other generation of what God had done for them. Israel, in other words, is to do for the poor what Yahweh had done for them. The Jubilee is especially a benefit to the marginalized, to the underprivileged, to the enslaved, to those in debt. So every Jubilee year is a reenactment, a reliving of the Exodus, a reminder, we were that, and God delivered us, he released us, he set us free, he, he gave us land, so we're going to do that for the poor in our midst. So again, it's a reminder that the people would not forget. <laughs>
So we got to remind ourselves as Christians, the Old Testament is God's word for us too, as Scott so beautifully explained last night. Now, one more reminder of the Exodus. Guess what kind of trumpets the seven the, the priests blew for seven days as they marched around the city of Jericho, the first city that they were to conquer when they entered the promised land, the land God had given to them that made the walls of the city fall down. <laughs> I have to say, I, after trying to learn this, I have greater respect for those priests who blew this all day for seven days. <laughs> we'll try it again later. <laughs> now, here's the rub. As Scott mentioned last night, many scholars actually doubt whether the Jubilee was ever celebrated, whether the Jubilee law was ever kept in ancient Israel. There's actually no mention of it actually being kept in the entire Old Testament. Oh, you think, why in the world not? It's very clear. This law that God gave his people, is, it's not ambiguous. What they are to do in terms of rest, release, and return in the Jubilee is very clear. Well, I think we can understand why not. If you're a wealthy landowner, do you want those highly lucrative vineyards making that fine Merlot to be absolutely shut down for two years? I don't think so. Do you want your, your cheap labor to suddenly be gone from your profitable agricultural business? No, I don't think so. Do you want the, the large prosperous farms that you acquired because other people had gotten into debt and you were able to buy them cheaply? Do you want them to return to their original owner? No, of course not. No, you want to keep growing your agribusiness. It's no wonder that they didn't keep the Jubilee and they ignored God's law. But God had warned them as far back as Leviticus chapter 26, when he warns of the consequences of not keeping the covenant, God said this, I will scatter you among the nations and I will unsheath the sword after you and your land shall be a desolation and your city shall be a waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest, the rest that you did not have on your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. In other words, the land is going to have its rest either by you following God's plan or by his divine discipline when you don't. It's going to get its rest because you're going to be carried off captive into an alien land. Well, the centuries passed. The people ignored God's law, his law of the Sabbath year, the, his law of the Jubilee year, and the prophets began to warn about it. We see it in Isaiah. Isaiah 5, 8 says, Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field. What does he mean? People are accumulating wealth by buying up other people's houses and fields and never giving them back in the Jubilee year. Who add field to field until there is no more room and you're made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. In other words, people getting so wealthy, they don't even have any neighbors. Their, their, their land has become so vast while others are getting impoverished. Woe to you. You can see how these prophetic warnings are valid in our time. Are they not? The prophet Jeremiah also warned about it. The very last king who reigned in ancient Judah, King Zedekiah, realized that things weren't looking so good when the, he saw the Babylonian, Babylonian Empire on the rise, growing in power and influence. And he realized we haven't exactly been keeping God's law. So he called for a jubilee. He said, whoops, we haven't so much been doing this. Let's have a jubilee. He called all the wealthy people to release their slaves and their debts. And so they did, except that a few years later, 
somehow they gotten they had gotten them all back. They were wealthy and powerful enough to do that. And therefore the prophet Jeremiah gave them this indictment and warning. Jeremiah 34:17, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming release. Deror everyone to his brother and everyone to his neighbor. You're to proclaim release to each other. Behold, I proclaim to you release to the sword, release to pestilence and to famine, says the Lord. You haven't kept my law by proclaiming release to one another. I proclaim release to sword, pestilence, and famine. Pestilence, that's another way of saying pandemic. Deadly disease, contagious disease that spreads throughout the people. I proclaim release uh, to those things because you have not followed my ways. God is saying, because you went back on my word and you, you've bound up your own kinsmen, your fellow Israelites, you've bound them up with debts. You've oppressed them with debts. You've bound them up even with chains as, as slaves. You're going to be bound up in chains and be sent to Babylon. What you sow is what you reap. And so sure enough, they, they experience the, the bitter fruit of ignoring God's law that he gives as a gift, his commands that he gives as a gift so that we may experience life. The fruit of ignoring God's commands is to end up captive to your enemies. In fact, they experience the very opposite of rest, release, and return. Instead of rest, they got toil and drudgery. Instead of release, they got bondage. Instead of return to their land, they got exile from their land. And guess who was taken off first? And, and, and most, the, most of the people taken off to Babylon, the elite, the wealthy, the ones who were primarily responsible for keeping the Jubilee, who had not kept it. So Israel had to learn the lesson of the Exodus all over again. And God patiently taught them that lesson all over again. In that low period, after they had experienced the devastation of conquest and exile, God spoke to them through the prophet Isaiah. And he announced that he's going to do something new. And this passage is incredibly important. It's one of the most important messianic passages in the Old Testament. It's in Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now, who's the speaker in that passage? Who, who, is, it, who is Isaiah giving voice to in that passage? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Messiah. He doesn't say who it is, but it's, but it's clearly the Messiah because, because the person says, the Lord has anointed me. How many of you biblical scholars know the Hebrew word for anointed? Messiah. Mashiach in Hebrew. Messiah means anointed. So this is the anointed one saying the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim release. Deror to captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What do you think he's referring to? The Jubilee. He's using that keyword release, and he's speaking of the year of the Lord's favor. This is a passage about the Jubilee, and it's saying the Messiah is going to bring the new and greater Jubilee, the final Jubilee, the eschatological Jubilee, the true rest, release, and return. And it, it goes on in that passage to say, to grant to those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. The Messiah is going to undo all the damage caused by the, the, the uh, disobedience to God's law, all of the consequences of miserable captivity and bondage. The Messiah is going to undo it all. He's going to proclaim and bring about 
the true everlasting jubilee. Now, when Isaiah gives this passage, most likely the Israelites, the, the people of Judah, have returned at that point from Babylon, but they are still being ruled by other kingdoms, first the Persians, and then the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire. So they haven't experienced yet this new exodus that Isaiah is talking about, this new jubilee, this release. And Isaiah doesn't say when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, only that it's going to happen. And so the Jews held on to that promise. They laid hold of that promise. They trusted in, in it. Some groups of Jews took it so seriously, like the, the Essenes, that they, they moved out to the wilderness to await the Messiah and the everlasting jubilee because Isaiah said that it's going to begin in the wilderness. So they went out there to, to very seriously await God fulfilling his promise. But by the time we get to the first century, it still hasn't been fulfilled. The Jews are now captive to the Roman Empire. So they're still looking forward to the, the day of vindication that God was telling them about in this Jubilee passage of Isaiah. And what happened when Jesus came? In the Gospel of Luke, he begins his public ministry by going into the synagogue at Nazareth. And he takes the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he opens it to the passage that he wants. Because it's going to announce, at the very beginning of his whole public ministry, it's going to announce his whole mission. Guess what passage he opens to? Isaiah 61, the Jubilee passage. And he read that passage with authority. Now, as Luke presents it, he also brings in a few other verses from elsewhere in Isaiah. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, a compilation, probably, of several passages that Jesus read. But this is the key passage, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. That's what had just happened. When? When did the Spirit of the Lord God come upon the Anointed One? At his baptism, we just prayed it in the first luminous mystery of the rosary, right? Those of you who are here, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. The, the fulfillment is happening right now. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. That means God has made me the Messiah, the anointed one. Why has he anointed me? To proclaim good news to the poor. Literally what it says is evangelize the poor. He's anointed me to evangelize the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release, deror, to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus is saying about his whole mission, it's a jubilee mission. I'm the one bringing about the promised new, final, everlasting, everlasting eschatological jubilee. We got to do this again. I think maybe the, 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 the crowd in the synagogue, in their ears, they heard that ram's horn as Jesus was proclaiming this passage from Isaiah 61. Then he rolled up the scroll. He sat back down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. That's exactly where our eyes are supposed to be, aren't they? It says in the letter of the Hebrews, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And that's what they did. It's a kind of dramatic moment. And he says, today, it is fulfilled in your hearing. It's a stunning statement. Jesus is saying, my whole mission is the fulfillment of the Jubilee. That ultimate rest, release, and return 
that was never carried out fully in the old covenant, but that Isaiah promised God is going to carry out. No wonder they were excited. So it says they all spoke well of him and they marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, isn't this Joseph's son? Did you notice a turn in their thoughts? They're, they're all excited. And, wow, and everlasting jubilee. Wait, we know this guy. I, who's he? He's just Joseph's son. They don't exactly have it right, do they? He's Joseph's foster son. God is his father. They are seeing Jesus in merely human terms. They don't get it. They just see him as a carpenter. It's just, just that guy from that backwater village, Nazareth. Well, that's the, the village they're in right now. We, we know him. We grew up with him. We played ball with him in the street. Who does he think he is? So at first they were excited, and then they start doubting. And they start putting Jesus in their box of their own thinking. Do we do that sometimes? Do we box the Lord in to our own ideas of what he can do, or what he can't do? They don't want to be challenged by him. And so Jesus began to say to them, amen, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And then he, he began to give them the example of Elijah and Elisha. And he says, in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in, the, in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up and a famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. None of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. What's the point of bringing up these two miracles from the Old Testament? These were miracles that God did for Gentiles, for those outside his covenant people. And, and both of the people Jesus mentioned, the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the leper, had great faith. And God did miracles for them. So Jesus mentions these two examples. But then when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. All of a sudden, their excitement, it just turned on a dime into wrath and murderous fury. Does that sound a little bit like Passion Week? You know, Palm Sunday, exuberant celebration. All of a sudden on Good Friday, crucify him! Well, what... What made them so upset? They didn't understand what Jesus was truly talking about, what he was truly announcing. A rest of the everlasting jubilee, much greater than rest from farm labor. labor. The everlasting rest in God who gives us everything, including our salvation. We don't have to earn it by our works by our our, our spiritual push-ups it's a gift the true rest the true release not just release from babylonians or romans release from sin and satan that's the release he's calling he's bringing about and return not just return to the homeland of israel but return to the true homeland, to God our Father, to the, the new Garden of Eden where we walk in intimate communion with God, our ultimate homeland in heaven. And once you understand that true jubilee that Jesus proclaims, you realize, well, that's for Gentiles too. They're not the enemy. They're not the, the, the oppressors that, that God is just going to blast and, and destroy. No, they are fellow recipients of the gift, the grace of the Jubilee. Now, what about all the injustice and the cruelty of the Roman Empire? Doesn't Jesus care about that? Well, it's not that Jesus is overlooking the, the, the very real political injustice, the oppression that, that people suffer on this earth. So his point is not, Oh, it's not really that bad with the Roman Empire. You know, that's, that, that's not really a, a problem at all. No, Jesus is saying, 
Actually, your bondage is much worse than you realized. Your bondage is much deeper than the rule of the Romans. It's a, it's a dominion of sin that you have all been captive to. You have all been under the oppression of Satan. He's the true enemy. It's that captivity of the heart that keeps you from your true homeland, that keeps you from possessing Yahweh himself, God himself, who is the true homeland. And so that's the release that Jesus is proclaiming. Gentiles and Jews are to receive it together. Well, the crowd in Nazareth that day is not so happy about that message. And so they tried to kill him by throwing him over the hill. But he passed through their midst because his mission was not yet complete. Well, the gospel then shows Jesus actually carrying out exactly what he had read from that passage in Isaiah, healing, setting captives free, casting demons out of people who were spiritually oppressed, forgiving sins, pouring out mercy upon them. But then the, the culmination of that whole mission actually occurs on the day of Pentecost, given in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, the, the day of Pentecost has a special connection with the Jubilee, because as the Jubilee is celebrated every 50th year, Pentecost is on the 50th day. It's the very meaning of the word Pentecost, the 50th day from the Passover Sabbath. And so it's on the day of Pentecost that Jesus' jubilee announcement of his whole mission comes to fulfillment in every member of the body of Christ. And that means that the permanent eschatological jubilee is to be lived in our lives, beginning with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are to live the daily, weekly, yearly, permanent jubilee. Now I'm going to conclude with just um, some very simple ways we can do that. We can live the Jubilee as rest by honoring the Sabbath, by taking time regularly, not only every Sunday, but at other times as well, for retreat, as you're doing here, enjoying friends and family, spending time with God, wasting time with other people, reminding ourselves that life is not about work. We can live the Jubilee as release by forgiving, especially the debt of sin. If any of you have, have come here this week with a, a hurt in your heart because somebody has offended you, whether it was last week or 40 years ago, now is the time to let that debt go. Live the Jubilee. Forgive. Forgive. Maybe some of you are even called to forgive monetary debts as well. And finally, we can live the Jubilee as return by returning to our first love. Our first love, the passion for Jesus that was kindled in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. When we first met him, when we were first filled with the Holy Spirit at our confirmation, we can return to that childlike trust in God that we've experienced at some point in our lives, or if you haven't experienced it yet, now is the time, return to the Lord your God. And finally, I wanna mention one special jubilee that I think we have as Americans. A few weeks ago, there was a decision of the Supreme Court that took place after precisely 49 years of the culture of death that legalized the killing of the most innocent and vulnerable people in our midst. And that Supreme Court Dobbs decision took place on the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which actually on the calendar was also the feast of, Saint John, of the birth of St. John the Baptist, who leapt in the womb for joy at the encounter with Jesus, it was also the very week when the, the Eucharistic revival called by the United States bishop, bishops began. A giant stronghold of evil was broken on that day. And the, <laughs> and the battle continues, but we 
need to live the, the year after the 49th year is the year of jubilee. And so in a particular way, we need to live this year as a jubilee of life, celebrating life with rest, release, and return.